And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're taking a look at yet another Gen Con release. This time we're going to be looking at Ninjato, which is a 2-4 player Euro game, uh, and this was probably the most anticipated game of Gen Con. Now, there was a ton of hype about this game, and they only bought about, uh, brought about 50 copies to the con. I was lucky enough to get my hands on one. Uh, so, with that said, why don't we take a look at what comes inside this box, how the game plays, and whether or not I think it lives up to the hype. So here we have the basic setup for a game of Ninjato. And there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to be zooming in on several areas of the board, but this is your basic worker placement game. Uh, and there are several pieces that are involved in this, but one of the most impressive is perhaps the shurikens that come with the game that act as your workers. And these are uh, some very large wooden pieces, and these are going to be the pieces you're going to be placing around the board to take your actions. Uh, you can see they're nice, they're made of uh, pretty solid wood, well painted and well designed, uh, and very easy to see when placed on the board. For example, like this. Uh, now this is one of my favorite parts about this game is these pieces, but aside from that, uh, we have a pretty, as I said, standard worker placement game. And in taking actions, you're going to be putting these shurikens on the board and performing different things in order to earn victory points. And now let's take a look at the few of those places on the board. One of the central focuses of the game is the clan houses, and these are represented by these guard cards and by several different markers that you're looking at here. So you'll see that there is these small tokens here, and then there's a larger token with a number printed on it, and this is going to be the victory points available for that area during scoring rounds. These three tokens are items that you're trying to collect, and you're going to be trying to collect them in order to turn them in to get points or multiplier cards that will score for you uh, during the scoring round and at the end of the game. Now. You're going to be capturing these goods by using these cards. These are called dojo cards, and these are some low ones. They go from one through five. Uh, and you're going to be using these in order to defeat the guards that are guarding these clan houses. For example, this guy here is a three guard. And in order to fight these guards, you're going to be placing one of your shurikens. So let's say the silver player here decides he wants to fight this guard, and he has two choices. He may either fight him with strength, which is the left-hand side, or he may fight him with stealth. And you'd look at your hand, and you'd see what kind of cards you have. So let's say I have these cards here. I have some pretty low cards. And in order to fight with stealth, you need to play lower than the current guard's value. So I'm low, probably a good idea to go stealth, because if I were to play strength, I'd have to play higher, and I can't do that. So I'd place my shuriken to the right-hand side of this guard, and I would begin taking my turn, and I would begin by playing one of my cards to beat him. So let's say I play this two, and the two is under a three, so I'm going to beat this guard and I would take the lowest valued good that the guard is protecting. So that would be one of these fans here. Uh, I'd place this on top of my shuriken, and then I'd have the option to go again. And if I wanted to go again, I would call Bonsai. And from a deck of cards, another player is going to come, and he's going to flip over a new guard. So we'll see here that he flips a five guard this time. But now I must play under the five if I can, and that's pretty easy. I have two ones. So I play one of my ones, and again, I have defeated that guard. So now, I'm going to take the next lowest good, and again, it's a fan, so we can see here this fan. Uh, we're going to put it on the shuriken. And now again, I'd have the choice to leave and take all of my goods, or I could continue to fight. And so, I say bonsai, I'm going to decide I'm going to fight a third fight, and out comes, this is called an alarm guard, and he's going to bring up a new good onto the board. So, I have a bag full of tokens, uh, it's right here, and I would reach into this bag and pull one out, and I would add it to the current house. So we have a four. And when this happens, the highest valued token at the, at the dojo house or at the clan house is always going to flip to a red side. And this means that when I get to that good, it's going to be guarded by an elite guard, which are harder to beat. As I've chosen to fight this guard, he's now a three. I'm going to have to beat him, and I have one, less, one, one more one card left, so I play it, and I, take, I defeat him, taking the lowest valued of the remaining pieces. I would now have to fight an elite guard. So I call Bonsai, and we look at this guard, and he is either a five in strength, meaning that I'd have to play over a five, or he's a one in stealth, meaning that I would have to play under a one. And this is possible through, through various actions in the game. Uh, for example, if you have a three card in your hand, a three can either be a three, or it can be plus or minus one to any other card. So if I played a one with a minus one, I could get a zero, and I could beat this guard, and I'd take that red good there, and we'd be done. I'd also keep this card because it's worth one point at the end of the game. 
If I were to take this last good, I would have wiped out the house and I would have shamed the clan guard sentry. That would be that first guard that I showed you here. And what's going to happen is he's going to commit seppuku on the turn. So he's going to kill himself. Uh, and in doing so, he leaves that house empty. Now what this allows you to do is it allows you to change the value of this token here. So this is a 4 for blue, and I'll explain this later, but essentially this is going to be victory points for whoever has the most blue envoys in the game. So if you're not collecting blue envoys, you're going to want to change this. And when you completely wipe out a house like this, it gives you the option to change it, and you have to change it to a different color, and those are red or green. So you have the chance to change this. Maybe you want, you're working for green, so you want to put out the green 8, and now there's going to be 8 points available for whoever controls green at the end of the scoring rounds. Another area on the board is the dojo. And I showed you the dojo cards that you'd be using to fight the guards earlier, and this is going to be where you're going to get more of them. And you'd simply place one of your shurikens here on the board, and you would get the chance to take cards. And how many cards you get is going to depend on how many cards you currently have in your hand. So if you were, for example, to have no cards left, you would get to take four cards, and you would do so between the face-up cards, and you'd have the choice of taking cards off of the top of the deck and adding them to your hand. If you only had one card left in your hand, you would get to take three cards and add them to your hand. If you have two or more cards, you're always going to get two. And in this manner, it prevents you from getting too large of a hand size, but allows you a benefit for draining your hand and then filling it back up. In addition to allowing you to get new dojo cards, placement on this area is going to determine turn order for future turns. And the person to place at the top of the order, so for example, let's say blue were to place at the top of the order, they would be first, now silver would be second, and red and uh, black would maintain their previous turn orders. A third option you can take on your turn is to go and get a new skill. And this is going to be done at the area called the Sensei. The Sensei here shows three skills on every turn except for turns five, six, and seven in which there will only be one skill available. And in order to take a skill, you're going to place one of your shurikens here, and you're going to choose which one of the skills you would like. And in order to obtain these, you're going to have to play cards, and those are those dojo cards that I showed you earlier. Now this here is a lion skill, uh, and it's going to flip you, uh, allow you to flip any one used skill back over to be used again. Now, you'll see there's a question mark here. That's because you can play any card in order to get this. But some of these skills require very specific cards. So for example, the crane skill here uh, of allowing you to switch between strength and stealth fighting uh, requires you to play a three. Whereas this snake skill, uh, which allows you to subtract two from any dojo card that you play, requires a one. Now, for each type of skill, you're only going to need to play a card once. And after you've acquired, for example, a lion skill or a tiger skill, you're going to never again have to play a card. So the next one of these you take is free. So if another one were to flip up on a future turn, for example, this one, which would usually require a five, if you already had this one in your possession, you could just place your shuriken there and take this without playing the card. Skills in the 5th, 6th, and 7th turn take a different form, and these are going to be in the form of these very special skills which have this mask at the bottom. These are going to be used to allow you to multiply one of your envoys and use him twice for scoring areas on the board. The fourth area you can place on during your turn is the pavilion, and these are going to be cards that are multipliers for the end of the game. You simply place your shuriken, and then you would have to uh, turn in goods to get one of these cards. So let's take a look at this card here. Uh, this guy, he's going to give you points uh, based on how many players have cards like this. So if only one player has a card like this, he's going to give you six points. If two players have a card like this, he's worth four. And if three players have a card like this, he's only worth two. And in order to claim this, you're going to need one of these little jade lion statuettes. You can see the picture here. Uh, and you're going to have to trade this in in order to get this card. Now, when you do so, you're going to get points for trading it in. And those little jade lion figures are worth five points. Um, you'll see other guys require different things, so this card here is a multiplier for your skills. For each one of these cards, it increases the multiplier. So if you have two cards, uh, it's going to be two times however many skills you have in points. If you have three cards, it's four times however many skills. And in order to get this, he's going to require one of one type of good and one of another type of good. The third type of card uh, gets you a multiplier for however many of these uh, pavilion cards that you have. And then we have one that gives you a reward for killing a bunch of elite guards. The fifth and final region you may place on here is going to be the palace, and this is where you're going to get envoys. And you would place your, your shuriken down, and again, much like the cards in the pavilion, you're going to be trading in goods in order to acquire 
these envoys. And so you can see here we have a blue envoy, and this number is her age, which is used as a tiebreaker for certain things. And in order to get her, you're gonna have to turn in one to four goods of the same type. So if I turned in four of these jade lions, I would get 20 points. If I turned in four vases, 16, four fans, I would get 12, uh, sorry, eight, and four of these scrolls, I would get 12. Um, and the whole point is to acquire these in order to have the most of them when it comes around to scoring turns. If I have the most of these, I'm going to get a choice. Either I may have all of the points depicted by those little tokens on the board, which were these again for that color. So if, if there's this just this two out, I could choose if I had the most blue cards to take two points, or I could choose to take any one card from the pavilion, which are those multiplier cards that I just showed you previously. So the game is going to last seven turns, uh, with each player taking turns in order as defined by the turn order chart. And after three turns, there's going to be a scoring round, and you can see this as indicated by the three little markers here next to the white marker. And you're going to score whoever has the most green on voice first, then whoever has the most red, then whoever has the most blue, and they'll either get their points or their pavilion cards. And then after round five, another scoring round with red first, then blue, then green. And then turns six and seven, and then a final scoring round with blue, then green, then red. At the end of all of that, you're going to total up whoever has the most points. You're going to look at your multiplier cards in order to add those. So, you know, if I was the only person with this, I'd get six points. And whoever has the most points at the end of all of that will be the winner. So that's Ninjato, and I have to say that this was probably one of my bigger disappointments for the con, which is actually opposite to what a lot of people are saying. They really enjoy the game. And I guess I can't say that I don't enjoy the game. However, what I can say is that it's not what I expected. This game is very much so on the level of Stone Age, in my opinion. And even in mechanics, it very highly reflects that game. You're collecting goods, uh, now through combat rather than through dice rolling, uh, but it's just a use of cards rather than dice, in order to trade them in for either points via the envoys or for multipliers via the cards in the pavilion. And really, that's all the game is. So, you know, very Stone Age-like, like the same weight, um, and didn't really provide anything different, which, would, which is what I was really hoping for. There was all this hype, and it really kind of let me down. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad game. As a matter of fact, it's a pretty good game. It's just not what I had hoped it would be. So, if you actually enjoy Stone Age, uh, and you're looking for another game along that line, I would definitely check Ninjato out. If you were hoping for a nice combat-related or heavier Euro game, Ninjato's not what you're looking for, and I would suggest that you look elsewhere. Either way, right now this game is a rarity, and if you have a chance to pick it up, I would suggest at least taking a look. You may love it, or you may be a little stagnant on it like I am. But either way, probably a decent purchase at the moment. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Ding.